your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, everyone? Welcome on in to another episode of Locked On Blackhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, thank you all for making the show your very first listen here to start off your day. And a reminder that you can go and show support down below by smashing that like button, commenting down below, and of course, go and subscribe to the Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube as well. It won't cost you anything. It's 100% free and really does go a long way for yours truly. Joining me today, a very special guest, a reoccurring guest. It's none other than Charlie Rumeliotis, who you probably recognize from all his great work with NBC Sports Chicago, one of the best in the business. Charlie, my friend, great to have you back on, dude. How's the uh, start of the season been treating you? Yeah, so I will be sending you a Venmo later for that really kind intro of yours. Um Okay, I have to say something. Every time I'm on here, something else gets added. Like last time I was on, you had a bottom line. Now there's an intro video, a little rundown on the side. Dude, this is this is sweet. I don't know what you're going to have in store next time I'm on, but it feels like every time I'm on, something new is is different or something different is is new with the show and it's uh it's solid. It looks sweet. I love the setup. Well, thank you very much for the kind words. The uh, the the hardworking folks behind the scenes here at the Lockdown Podcast Network will greatly appreciate that. And yeah, it's a, a pretty solid setup here, man. It's uh, starting to get starting to get the whole full effect that we're wanting. So <laughs> glad to hear that uh, you're enjoying it as well. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, man. Ready to talk some Blackhawks? Yeah. How, how was uh, how's the start of the season treating you? I know we were talking off air that it's been. Uh, a little bit of a wonky schedule. We were busy right out of the gate, and then we've been getting a lot of time off. How have you been uh, handling kind of going through the ringer here so far? Yeah, it's been a very weird schedule. We were obviously, like you said, talk, talking about it off the air where it, all this practice time, it feels like we're in the middle of training camp again, where it's game and then it's off day, practice, practice, game, then it's practice. Pra- I mean, it's just you kind of wanted to get into a, a rhythm of the games and we're, we're eventually going to hit that point in the schedule where we are getting games every other night, but it, it is very weird having a lot of time in between games. So just trying to find the storylines, but also not wanting to beat a storyline to death because we're still dissecting the game from like three days ago. So um, it's been a, a weird challenge, but good good to be back in the, in the full swing of things nonetheless. Yeah. I've been kind of having similar problems here on the show. I don't want to give all my <laughs> listeners out there just the same content day in and day out. So uh, we did look forward to the month of December for the Blackhawks schedule, and we won't be saying the same thing in <laughs> less than a month's time, Charlie. The Blackhawks are going to be having games every other day, so we'll have plenty of games to cover, which will keep us nice and busy. But yeah, the Blackhawks, obviously, Charlie, are 13 games into the start of the regular season. Now they're off to a... Five, eight, and no start. We know Connor Bedard is lighting the world on fire. Don't worry, everyone. We'll get to him in just a second. But before we do that, Charlie, I kind of wanted to hear what maybe were your expectations for this Blackhawks team going into this season. And now that we're 13 games in, not the biggest sample size, but we're starting to get a little, little bit of an idea here, right? Um, what has kind of maybe been something that you learned or, or something that's caught your eye through these first 13 games? Yeah. Um, it's kind of been what I've expected as far as where they're at in the standings and just, I know they have a lot of young players like Connor and, and Reichel and Korchinski and Kaiser and Vlasic, but there are some veterans mixed in to make sure that a lot of, there are some stabilizers in there. So like the one thing that is very notable for me is anytime there's a, a bad loss, the Blackhawks tend to bounce back with, with a with a nice win, right? I think about the the it was these the Montreal game. Let's just go back to the start of the season. Montreal. I remember talking to Tyler Johnson uh, in the locker room, and he was like, he was not happy with the performance, even though they were tight. It was tight at the end. He just was not happy with it. They bounced back with a big win in Toronto, which was probably their most complete effort of the season, even to date. Um, and then there was that that Boston loss that Luke Richardson called out his team. The next day, they end up having a multi-goal win in Vegas to hand them the first loss of the season, overtime victory. And then um, 
And then obviously they had the the players only meeting and and they bounced back from that. And these are all really good teams that there's another one I'm missing in there, but these are all really good teams that they're bouncing back against. I think the problem is stringing together the wins, you know, like it's, it's one thing to have those to bounce back performances from the losses, but then having that win, but not being able to follow it up. That's where we're seeing maybe the, it's hard for that. It's hard for this Blackhawks team. And I'm writing about this on Tuesday for NBC Sports Chicago, but the schedule has been terrible for Chicago. Like so bad. they don't have a breather. I mean, it's all these elite NHL teams, the best of the best. And so it's it's just it's it's hard to kind of get momentum. I, I think they eventually will get there, but that's that's been the early read on my on the the situation for me so far. And that's something I feel like fans can buy into, right? And Maybe, you know, we don't expect this Blackhawks team to go and compete for the Stanley Cup playoffs this season, but we did want to start seeing some signs of life and not, you know, having those games or those stretches where they go three or four games where they look completely lost and fall flat on their face, especially as you referenced against some of the best teams in the NHL. Those Mm -hmm. are things it feels like where we can start to see. I know it's still early in this rebuild, but just progression because think about the last couple of years how many times we saw this Blackhawks team go on five six seven game or even more losing streaks right and it feels like even going back to last year with Luke Richardson that really hasn't been the case so that's definitely been something that's very noticeable to me Uh, you brought up actually Luke Richardson kind of calling out his team a little bit following that I believe it was a three nothing loss to the Boston Bruins is what it was what did you make of that because at the time it felt like I mean, I get it, dog, but they're also like going through the ringer here. But I do feel like at the same time, that's what makes Luke Richardson, Luke Richardson and us, us. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think I I loved I love the mindset of it, like calling out. I don't think he was calling out his team because he was like, we expect to be a right. playoff team this year and or whatever. He knows the situation, right? But as a coach, you also have to make sure that you're setting the standard and and not allowing those young players to kind of get used to hey this is a rebuilding year i it's going to be tough but you know let's just get through it like they they still want to internally set a high standard within that locker room right so i think that's where luke is saying hey yeah we were able to hang our hat on we had the hard working label last year but we want to we want to see improvement we want to take strides this year and not get used to how last year felt they're losing last year. Right. So, I mean, the Blackhawks are still going to finish towards the bottom of the NHL in the standings, and they're going to get a high pick again this year, but it's still important to kind of set that expectation of, Hey, let's not be satisfied. Let's push for more this year. Even if the results don't show it, like, let's still make sure that we're trying to at least aim to do it. Um, so it, it is a, it is a fine bet. And I don't think Luke was saying, I don't think Luke is, like he, wasn't he understands him. he wasn't yeah, dogging him. Yeah, and he also understands the situation. He's he, it's not like this roster was put together to you know to compete. Like he he knows he's not dumb. Um, but he as a coach, you're you you do not want to settle for it, you know. You don't want to make sure that it's like so I, I I didn't mind it, and even the players only meeting, like a lot of like I got a lot of comments from that from fans just saying, like, that was a bizarre game to have a players only meeting. But well, one, they didn't play terrible and two it's not like the Blackhawks are the Edmonton Oilers where there were Stanley Cup favorites and they're like we we got a slow start out of the gates what's going on like the Hawks were supposed to be bad again this year but again it's the Nick Felinos, the Corey Perry's the Connor Murphy's all those guys in the room are like hey let's let's make sure that we're still uh holding ourselves to a high standard because this is how it should be when we are you know a playoff contender or Stanley Cup contender whenever we get to that point Yeah, I completely agree. Those were basically the same sentiments that I felt about that matter that I said on my show. Uh, Charlie, we've gone nine and a half minutes here and we haven't brought up that Connor Bedard guy. I don't know how my listeners Mm -hmm. and viewers are going to be feeling about that. So we're going to talk about the 18 year old phenom here for a little bit. Obviously he's starting to get it going here. He's now got back to back two goal performances that gives him seven in his last six and nine through his first 13 NHL games. And this isn't maybe necessarily to make it seem like he got off to a slow start. He was still getting his footing and everything. But now it feels like he's gotten to the point where he's not just figuring it out anymore. He's starting to learn 
what it takes to take over games. Maybe what have you seen out of him in these last few nights uh, that, that maybe has stood out to you and you think maybe led to his recent breakthrough? Or was it just simply a matter of time because he's that damn good? Yeah, probably a little bit of both. But I think more so what's impressing me is not the fact that he is scoring goals. It's how he's doing them. It's it's out muscling a Norris Trophy winner who's double his size in Victor Hedman. It's stripping Nikita Kucherov, who's an MVP winner in this league, in the neutral zone to create a scoring chance. It's you know it's beating Sergei Bobrovsky with an insane shot from 13 feet out. I mean, it's these are the some of the best goaltenders or best players in the world. Um, Bobrovsky has two Vezina trophies in, on his career, so it's like, and I think where. Um, Connor gets so much praise for his shot and his playmaking ability. But the the thing that I've seen the biggest growth from game one to game 13 is he has become a relentless four checker and he's not afraid to get to go to the, go to the dirty areas where, you know, like if there are other skilled players in the NHL, typically it's like, okay, pair them with a guy that will go do the dirty work. And then they will give the puck to the, to the skilled player. Connor's like, Hey, I'll go do the dirty work too. get the puck for myself. And then we can create our entire line. And that is a different layer to his game. And it, I, I said it on our podcast today, but it, it kind of reminds me of Alex to Remember when he had that really, uh, he had that down year where he, he didn't score a lot. And he was like, man, I, I have to, I have to r- round out my all around game. And he like the next season, he obviously scored. He got bounced back in the goal column, but he became a relentless four checker. He was stripping pucks. He was being that gritty guy. We're seeing that with Bedard and it took him 13 games to, to realize it or maybe not realize it, but like Luke Richardson said, they, they were kind of pushing him to be more physical as far as like winning board battles and going out and getting stripping pucks. I mean, boy, oh boy. It's, I mean, we, we already saw that pay off immediately in Tampa Bay and then in Florida. So I, I think the floodgates are just starting that now he's not going to have four points or three points every night, but the floodgates are going to open as far as him creating even more chances because he's kind of had this realization that he should be doing or, you know, just become a relentless four checker. Yeah. And it feels like obviously the, the big talk about him was the release and the goal scoring abilities that he has, but I think maybe the biggest thing that surprised me is just how much he's able to, it feels like he's almost a a Sidney Crosby type of player where I remember players saying about Sidney Crosby, he's the grindiest top line center that you'll see because he just does things. He'll go against opposing teams, top players, like we've seen Bedard do a lot this season. And now he's, we're starting to see him strip players of the puck and not just show off that strong wrister. He's scoring goals by forcing turnovers himself and, it feels like he's really allowing himself to to find that next gear and is really getting that confidence in all areas of the game, not just when the puck is on his stick. He's doing it by taking it away from other guys and, as you referenced, some of the best players in the NHL. So that's kind of been, I think, maybe the biggest ascension that we've seen in the last few days. I also wanted to ask you, Charlie, um, what has maybe been the biggest – thing that surprised you about Connor Bedard is someone that gets to cover him. And obviously there's the media circus that follows him. Has there been anything at all in particular that's surprised you about him? Well, I think the fact that he, he lives and breathes hockey, which we all knew this, but it is to a different level than even I thought to the point where it's kind of like a running joke. Now he's always the last one off the ice in practice. And he stays out there significantly longer than everyone else that the Blackhawks will open up their locker room so we can do our interviews, whether it's a practice, a morning skate. And because he's still out on the ice, we have to like wait for him to get off the ice. And sometimes we're in there a very long time, like waiting to talk to Connor. And because we're waiting to talk to Connor, that pushes back Luke Richardson's media availability. So like Luke Richardson, and I think he made the joke again today where he's like, we got to kick Connor off the ice sometimes because it's (laughs) delaying me by like an hour and a half of coming up here and talking to you guys. So it's a joke. But when we say he lives and breathes hockey, he legitimately, this is all he does. I mean, it's just, it reminds me, I don't even know what it reminds me of. I, I mean, it reminded me of Patrick Kane at the end of, like the last few years here in Chicago where he would always be out in the ice working with the or working with, with some of the younger players, but 
boy, oh boy, it's every single practice that Bedard is the very last guy off the ice and we're kind of just sticking around waiting for him. So, I mean, that's the thing that's impressed me the most. It's not, it's not just, he gets by with his skill and he's so talented. It's this guy puts an insane amount of work into his craft. And during training camp, like somebody had told me the security guards there were, they, they were waiting on Bedard every single day. Like he was the last guy out of the building every day. I mean, that, that guy's 18 years old and he he's kind of setting an example inside that organization. I don't think he's being, um, like he's not doing it for show. I mean, he, he is, I mean, he, he is so dedicated to his craft that it's just, it's crazy to see up front and in person, um, how that manifests itself onto the ice too. And I remember going back to the summer when development camp was happening and they went all off the ice this year. I remember hearing, it might've been from Kyle Davidson. Maybe it was from Luke Richardson, but, but someone spoke out about how Bedard was already kind of showing leadership capabilities, despite, you know, the team or the players not being out there on the ice. It feels like that's just by the work ethic that he has drilled into him already at such a young age. Like if you see, if you're a fellow Blackhawks prospector, shoot, even a player that's playing with him right now and you see the 18-year-old kid putting in the work like that, yeah, I'm sure veterans are not going to be, you know, taking it to that level. And we've even heard some guys say, hey, kids, you don't want to burn yourself out too early in the season. But for other prospects and for future Blackhawks moving forward to see a kid who has all the talent in the world and is a generational type prospect, for him to have that work ethic alongside it and to have that first man in last man out type of mentality. I think that's all us Blackhawks fans could ask for out of him. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even the, the fact that Korchinski is the one that hangs around with him. Like for example, at practice today, uh, Korchinski, there were a lot of, there were there like five young guys that were on the ice well after practice ended. They were the last five guys and it was Bedard, Korchinski, Reichel, Vlasic, Kaiser. I think Phillips was in there too. And so, then one 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 by one, those young players start to kind of trickle out, and then it's two guys left. It's Korchinski. Well, at first it was three guys. It was Reichel, Korchinski, Bedard, and then Reichel went into the locker room, and then it was just Korchinski and Bedard. Well, there was a reporter that requested to talk to Kevin Korchinski, wanted to do an interview with him. Korchinski comes inside the locker room today. He does the interview, and then he goes back onto the ice to continue his post workout, whatever, with Bedard, like. If Connor is still not out there, Korchinski doesn't go back out. You know what I mean? Like it's just, right. it's an example of it, like, Hey, this Connor Bedard, he's the best player on the, on the Chicago Blackhawks. He's 18 years old. He's still putting in the work, even though he can probably get by on his skill. Let's be honest. And it's like, it's forcing these other young players to say, well, if I'm not like, for example, it's hypothetically speaking, if you're Lucas Reichel, you're having a tough time putting on points. You're, you're having a tough time kind of breaking through this year. Yeah, like I would feel weird if I was one of the first ones in the locker room and I'm like, here's Connor out here still grinding his butt off and he's on an absolute heater. You know what I mean? Like he, he, he earned, he could earn a day to kind of just like, eh, maybe this would be a short practice for me. I'm just going to go out and you know, like that's how it, it rubs off on those people. And I remember talking to, I think it was Patrick Sharp. He was like, what, he's like, what made our, what what made the dynasty era of the, like those cup era teams so good like that core is they were all so competitive with each other that it's like if Kane and Sharp were doing these practice drills then it's like Taves would come and Hosa would come and they would all just like feed off of each other's competitiveness so i think having Connor Bedard as that leader uh of this new core is just it's going to rub off on others. And if it doesn't, it like you might not be part of this core. <laughs> <laughs> For real. Um, I also wanted to give you some props here, Charlie, because I thought a couple of weeks ago, you wrote a really good piece about how you're trying to balance not having the spotlight and not being all over Connor Bedard 24 seven, but also still doing your job and putting out the content that Blackhawks fans wanted to see. Uh, I thought you put it in a, a really good manner and I thought it was a really well done post for those of you out there listening or, or watching this, you can uh, go and find that article. I believe you still have it pinned on your uh, X yeah. profile. So definitely make sure to go and check that out. But obviously it's been a, a very hectic world for Connor Bedard these last five, six months. How, how do you feel that he's handled it all? I mean, we, we were just talking about his work ethic, obviously, and all that stuff. And there's been a lot of talk of how mature he is at 18 years of age, but, 
How, how do you feel like he's he's handled that? Do you feel like he enjoys it? Like he just brushes it to the side and understands it's part of it? Well, what do you think he he feels about all of it? Yeah, I think I think he's so used to it by now that it's just he knows that it's just part of something that he has to do. Um, it's funny because I've sometimes I find myself not wanting to ask a question to him, even if I want to ask it, because I I've been around him already so much that I'm I'm like I already know what his answer is going to be. You know, like right. it's kind of weird where it's like okay, you know, for example, like Tampa. Um, in Tampa and in Florida, he was obviously on hat trick watch for both of those games. And uh, Thursday, the Tampa Bay game, he was asked after the game, like, "Hey, what, were at all, at any point were you thinking about the hat trick? You know what I mean?" And he was he totally like shrugged it off, like, "Oh, just, I'm just focused on making the right play. I don't really care or whatever." Well, then on on uh, Sunday against Florida, you know, like it could have been easy for me to say, "Hey, were you thinking about the hat trick?" But I'm like, first of all he doesn't like individual accolades. So he's not going to answer this in the way that I think he will or right. want him to. And two, it's like, I already know what he's going to say. Cause I heard it on Thursday. You know what I mean? It's just some of those things that, um, it is weird. It is weird. Cause it's like, you don't want to not ask a question, but you, it kind of challenges you as a reporter to try to think of a new question or think of a different question to ask him so that it's not just a, the same answer or, or a generic, he can just go to his well of answers that, you know, so um, it, it is a weird balance. And like I had somebody say, Hey, it's, it's not your job to protect, you know, the kid it's, it's the team's job to make sure. And I'm, I get that. But at the same time, as somebody that feels like morally convicted that I, I could potentially be playing a role in, in the circus and, and not wanting to overwhelm him or feel like he's kind of suffocating. Um, I do try to pick my spots and when I talk to him, what I need from him and not just, you know, kind of bothering him with nothing. Cause I'm sure there are times where he, he wants to practice. He wants to go to a morning skate and he just wants to go to his locker and just talk to the guys. And like, you kind of just want to respect his space too. Cause that is their sanctuary in there. Like, I know we have a job to do, but it's also, yeah, you know, it's also, you don't want to bother them in their environment. So, um, I I'm not sure I'll ever get it right. Like, I don't know if I'll ever, I don't know if he'll ever see me as, or, if he'll ever be like, oh yeah, Charlie, he strikes the right balance. Like he might get annoyed with me. He might not. I don't know, but hopefully at least I, I feel like, uh, if I'm thinking about that, at least it's a positive step. Well, I know many Blackhawks fans out there think you're doing a fantastic job in terms of the balance covering Connor Bedard. So you're, don't... you're upping your Venmo, by the way, from earlier. <laughs> hey, keep them coming, baby. Uh, but I know I do I do not feel alone when I say that. We think you're doing a phenomenal job of covering Connor Bedard so far this season. A couple minutes ago, you mentioned Lucas Reichel. He's another young player that's garnering some attention right now, but for opposite reasons than Connor Bedard is. He's only got two points, both assists through his first 13 games this year. He's been kind of moved around in the lineup between the center and the wing. It feels like it's kind of like a, a daily practice update at this point. Where is Lucas mm -hmm. Reichel? Is he playing down the middle or is he <laughs> off on the wing? Uh, what are kind of your, your thoughts on Lucas Reichel's slow start here? It does feel like he's gotten it going a little bit these last few games, but after seeing what we saw in, in training camp in late last year, I don't know about you, but it felt like he was – on that bubble of maybe becoming a really big impact player for this Blackhawks team this year. And I even went as far to say as in my uh, kind of um, far fetched predictions, if you will, on the Blackhawks this season, I said, it wouldn't be crazy if Lucas Reichel led them in points. And that just doesn't look like it's translated so far in these first 13 games. What have you kind of seen about Reichel's game and what are your thoughts on, on this start of his? Yeah, it was, I go back to the, the very opening road trip of the season and my biggest takeaway from those five games is his line. They had really tough first periods, but then they really bounced back in like the second and third. So it, there was a little bit of a slow start, but then you get into game eight, game nine, and it's like, he didn't have a point. And <laughs> I know, I know they're, they're like points aren't everything. Like yeah, you could look across the NHL and you know, if, if players go on point droughts, you, Sometimes you can look at the analytics and be like, this guy's due. I, I don't know if I ever have felt that with Reichel. Like, I don't think, oh man, it's only a matter of time before the floodgates open. He's creating a ton of chances. They're just not going in. I don't really feel that. And I think that's a little bit more concerning. Um, but I will say this. I, I think 
and I remember writing this last year, I just think long-term he's better on the wing. He was drafted as a winger. It's hard, to, it's hard to remember that because he's been center essentially every time he's been in this organization. But he was drafted as a left winger, and it was his German team that ended up moving him to center overseas right out, out of the draft year. And he overachieved there. And they're like, oh, okay, the Hawks were like, we'll keep him there and let him continue to develop. And I actually didn't mind it. I, th- I was like, that's a good idea. Let, let him kind of round his all around, all around game, make him become a little bit more defensively responsible. And then you can bump him to the wing in the NHL. And he already has those defensive instincts in him. And it's weird how, if you break down the numbers of Reichel as a center in the NHL versus Reichel as a winger, I mean, it is night and day, the production at least, but having, having watched him this year, like I was one of the guys that was like, Hey, time to move him to wing. Like it's, I think it was after game, game nine or 10. I think it was after the Boston game. I can't remember which, which one. And sure enough, they, they ended up moving him to wing the next day, but he still hasn't been great. So like, I, I don't want to say that like I've, I'm validated and thinking that, Oh, that was the right move because today at practice, we're recording this on Monday night. He, he was on, he was at center again because there was no uh, Athens who's out. So Here's my feeling, though. This is a long-winded answer, but I, I think playing wing for him is more mentally freeing than anything. Like, I think if you look at the video of him playing center and him playing wing, like the Blackhawks internally might be like, it's not all that different. It's it's, it's very it's it's kind of similar, but it's not different. I just think for him, if he knows I'm a wing, like I'm playing wing, somebody else can handle the defensive responsibilities, be the guy down low. And I don't have to be the the last guy into the offensive zone because I'm leading. It just feels like it frees him up a little bit. We haven't seen that in the few games that he has been playing wing this year, but I still feel like that's where he's best suited. And so I think that's where he's best suited long-term too. Like when the Blackhawks are, and that's, this is a confusing part to me too. The, the Blackhawks seem, or they seemed um, adamant that we want him at center. Yeah, but it's not like he. It's not like they don't have centers in the pipeline, like Oliver Moore, Frank Nazar. They're gonna have two first round picks again this year. They're gonna have to. It's not like they have to be married to it, you know. I think, and this is my theory. I think they were just really challenging him to see how mentally tough he he could be. Like, hey, we're giving you this challenge of being a center. Like, show us what you're made of. And to his credit, he actually got better in the faceoff circle. Yeah, he's really improved there. Um, so I wouldn't be opposed to maybe just throwing him out there on draws, but then letting him kind of drift over to the wing. But it seems like they're, they want him, they want him more like, Hey, uh, we want you to chat. We want to challenge you to, to be better as a center while the the puck is in play, as opposed to the faceoffs. I don't know. That's just my theory on it. I'm not, you know, like I'm sure there, there are divided opinions out there, but I just think ultimately he, he is a winger and that's where he should be when the Blackhawks are. Uh, you know, a playoff contenders at some point down the road. And where are you on kind of, you know, people have been saying, give him opportunities with Connor Bedard up on that top line. And it felt like going into the season, maybe this is just my opinion from an outsider's look. It felt like leaving Reichel when he was at center two at the time, leaving him down at the, at the second line allowed them for, for maybe to maybe an opportunity to create a, a reliable second scoring line. But it feels like the bottom six has kind of been the ones who have been chipping in second fiddle behind Connor Bedard in that top line. Do you think that's going to happen sometime soon? Or do you think the Blackhawks are wanting to keep them separate for the time being? Yeah, I think, well, I, I don't think you can separate them now because the Felino Bedard Kurashev line is really, yeah. is, has been solid. Right. But where, where I would like to see that is the power play, like put Bedard and Reichel together, at least on the power play, because that's where they can both get some confidence and that's where they're both, their skill sets can thrive the most. So if a guy like Bedard or um, Reichel is struggling to get offensive production, rather than taking away ice time from him and may, putting him on the second unit and dropping him down in the lineup, I, I'm of the proponent and this is situational because the Blackhawks are not, they would, my answer would be different in three years. If the Blackhawks are competitive and they're Stanley cup contenders, like that's where you have to like, you have to bench guys. You got to go with the guys who are going, but as a young player, like we got, we got a guy that only has only two points in 13 games. 
we, we have to put him in situations where he can start gaining confidence. And so yes. to me, that's, Hey, put him on the first power play with Connor Bedard. There's no Taylor Hall right now. So you, you can kind of find a way like they have Felino and Perry both on the first unit, like take one of them out, take Felino out and put Reichel there and let Kurashev play the, the bumper or some, something that get, you can, they, the Hawks can get creative in that. And I think eventually I would like to see Reichel and Bedard on a line together. Um, maybe when Kurashev and Felino and Bedard, when that kind of fizzles out, I, I guess my, um, the challenge would be not, who would you put on that line to make sure that you you're protecting the two of them? Because I think back to the Florida game, Dmitry Kulikov makes that big hit on Connor Bedard and it was Reese Johnson and Nick Felino that immediately went to his defense. If that happens, you know, Reichel takes a big hit. Is it going to be Khrushchev? Is it going to be Bedard? Like who you better hope one of the defensemen like Tenority or Murphy are on the ice. So that can, you know what I mean? That's the only thing, but I, I agree with the sentiment that Reichel and Bedard, it feels like if it feels like they, they were made to play for with each other because of their, their skill sets, they complement each other. I feel like at some point you just got to give those two some opportunity if it's, if not together on the top line, then on the power play, because something I've said the last couple episodes of my show, I'm sure Lucas Reichel is not having the most fun time right now. Right? Like I'm sure he's well aware of his situation and you just got to do something to give him some confidence and get him kind of just kickstarted again. Right. So that's kind of why I've been, at least from my end, uh, preaching to the heavens that they give him some time on that top power play. And I also did want to ask you, would you consider putting him up there with Nick Felino and Connor Bedard? Because I'm sure this was also a result of Bedard just getting more reps and getting more uh, experience under his belt. But his game has elevated too a little bit since Nick Felino got jumped up on that top line, which I don't think that was a statement anyone envisioned saying before this Blackhawk season. Would you consider that at all? Or what are your thoughts on a trio like that? Just yeah, I'm conversation. Yeah, I think, I think if you, if you do put Reichel with Bedard, I think it m might make more sense to have a guy like Felino on the line to make sure that he's kind of like the protector and right. and doing the dirty stuff. At the same time, Kurashev and Bedard have been so good together that I would just have a hard time separating them. Um, which is funny because going into training camp, it felt like Reichel, Kurashev, and Athanasiu were going to be together, and they have not played together at all this year. I know because Kurashev was hurt at the beginning of the year. After the CU is now hurt, and then it was Reichel centering, and then he got moved to the wing. And it's just it, it's funny how like they haven't even those three haven't played together at all. Um, but I'm sure at some point down the road we will see it. That Kurashev Bedard, they they might the offense might dry up a little bit for them together, and then you try something new, and then you see Reichel there or Felino get swapped out or whatever. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I would separate Bedard and Kurashev until the offense really dries and the chances start to, to dry up too. Right. And speaking of Nick Felino too, the veterans, the veteran additions that the Blackhawks brought in this off season of him, Corey Perry, who's off to a phenomenal start as well. Taylor Hall, not maybe necessarily as much of a veteran as those other guys, but Ryan Donato has been a really sneaky, good addition as well. Um, I, I feel like Charlie, that's been a, a huge factor in a, a huge proponent, I guess I could say in getting through to the rest of this team, what Luke Richardson is preaching. It feels like those have really been the guys who have kind of, like you said earlier, um, Tyler Johnson was pissed off after the, the Montreal game, despite them being right there up until the end. It feels like the veterans have really been the ones that have kind of allowed this to, to resonate with the rest of the team. Do you think that's a fair statement? It just feels like they're playing such a huge part in the Blackhawks on and off the ice so far this year. Yeah, they really are. And the Blackhawks had a lot of, they, they had veterans last year too, with, with obviously with yes. Kane and Taves, but it's different when you have players like Felino and Perry, you have players from all over the league. Tyler Johnson came from Tampa. Nick Felino was a captain in Columbus, Corey Perry, all those years in Anaheim. It's like, you have all these different veterans than Seth Jones, obviously from, from Columbus as well you have all these different veterans that have experiences outside of Chicago to kind of unify them together and just be like, okay, like, what did you learn? What did Felino, what, what could he learn and, and bring 
to this locker room? What did Perry learn from his days in Anaheim and Tampa and Montreal and Dallas that he can bring to this locker room? What did Seth Jones learn from Columbus wearing an A? You know, what did, What can Connor Mur Tyler Johnson, all these veterans are kind of just molding this group. And I think that's a unique part of the, the, the leadership group. Whereas last year it was Kane, it was Taves. They were drawing from their cup years. Now it's like you have all these different mix of veterans. And I think it's a very unique locker room this year. And I think it is very valuable to these younger players that they don't have just one play, one or two players that they can kind of lean on. They have three, four, five that they can kind of look to and be like, oh, okay, that's what you learned there. That's that's cool. Like I'll take a mental note of this. And it, it kind of feels like uh, in my mind, it's just the tough result of the NHL being a business at the end of the day. Those veterans probably aren't going to see the impact that they're having on these young players. But I feel like this is such an important time frame in the Chicago Blackhawks in the direction they're heading in. And I, I couldn't be more thrilled to have veteran leaders like that to, to show these young guys the ropes and the in and outs and the day-to-day -day stuff. It, it feels like that is really going to play a, a huge benefit to these young players who are around right here, right now, moving forward in their careers. And obviously we've also only heard only good things about Nick Foligno and Corey Perry, who I never thought, how weird is it by the way, to go and Barry. interview Corey Perry and Blackhawk stuff, man, because very, yeah. Can't, okay. Can't Jack. Add. So my first, one of my first, it was like my first game ever. First Blackhawks game I have ever covered was uh, the game. One of the 2015 Western conference final. It was oh, Blackhawks. Not a big deal. ducks. I was 22 years old. So obviously I was a ner I was nervous. I was like, Whoa, whoa what am I doing here? And I was tasked with like Tracy Myers was the Blackhawks insider at the time. She was obviously covering Blackhawks angles. I was tasked with covering the visiting team. So I went into the Anaheim ducks locker room after every game. And I would see Corey Perry. I would see Ryan Getzlaff. And to this day, side note, I also did the series after that, which was the St. Louis Blues. It was Blackhawks Blues in 2016. The, the 2015 Ducks, after they lost game six and it was going to a game seven, I felt like I was walking into a morgue in the Anaheim Ducks locker room. It was very like, it, it would like when I walked into that locker room and I was, we were talking to these players in my head. I didn't say it at the time in my head. I'm like, Anaheim's losing game seven for sure. They're losing game seven because wow. they felt like they lost that game. And then the next year they faced the blues and it went to game seven. I remember David Backus, Petrangelo after game six, they're like, we're good. We're good. And I thought to myself, I think St. Louis is going to win game seven. And sure enough, it happened. Now it's, you, the the fans that are listening to this are probably like Charlie, you're full of it, but no, that is exactly <laughs> what I felt, and I think that's the the unique opportunity of having that locker room access. So back to your question about Corey Perry, I have this memory of him talking after Game Six and how dejected he was after after that game, and I'm just like, it is so weird that nine years ago you were in the visiting locker room, and I remember how how dejected you were after that loss. And now he's sitting inside the Blackhawks locker room, like two stalls over from where Kane's stall was, or maybe one stall over. And I'm just like, this is weird. So yes, to your answer, to your question, Jack, it is still very weird to me. It was, it, it was weird to me when, um, what game was it last week? I think it was one of the home games where, um, I actually think it was, it might've been the Boston game. Corey Perry did something and, it was like the Blackhawks fans were cheering him like crazy. I'm like, if Corey, Perry, if he was wearing a different sweater, this entire stadium would be booing him right now. But because he's wearing a Blackhawks sweater, it's all, it's like, it is mind boggling to me how it's, he's, he is the ultimate hate that guy when he's not on your team, but you love him when he is. Yeah. It, we needed no further proof that we live in a simulation and Corey Perry <laughs> signing with the Chicago Blackhawks, but it feels like a, I mean, Corey Perry's to a different extreme, but it, it's like what happened with Max Domi kind of last season. Maybe some people didn't have that hatred for Max Domi, but I, I personally did a little bit after uh, there was one scuffle he had with Connor Murphy in Columbus, a real bad one where I'm like, this is oh, an yeah. absolute <laughs> lunatic. I don't know if you remember that, but I'm yep. like, we really went out and signed this guy. And then we ended up <laughs> loving him. I knew that was going to happen with Corey Perry, but um, yeah, crazy how time flies and situations happen like that. Right. But 
he'd been obviously a huge part of the the Blackhawks early success as a veteran leader there. Um, I know we've been chatting a little bit here, Charlie kind of ran a little bit longer than I intended, but so I got a couple more questions for you and then I'll Let's let you it. get on out of here. Um, got to talk about the young defenseman here for a second as well, because that's a huge part of this Blackhawks team. Kevin Korchinski, Wyatt Kaiser, Alex Vlasic have been in the lineup all year when healthy for Vlasic's case, but I'm interested in your feeling of this Blackhawks defense as a whole with Isaac Phillips kind of being the odd man out in the mix because he was someone last year who got some good NHL action and looked the part. And, and probably if the situation were different, if we didn't have all three of those young defensemen in the lineup, it feels like he could be an everyday NHL or with the Blackhawks and doesn't look like Korchinski's going anywhere. There were some questions about Wyatt Kaiser, where he was going to start the season and he's been in Chicago the whole time. How, how do you feel about, the way they've managed this so far and and your thoughts on the three guys who have obviously been playing in these games so far this year. Yeah. It's weird how the pipeline went from being very thin on the back end to the Blackhawks have some decent defenseman prospects outside of Korchinski. You know, they, they got Vlasic Kaiser, Isaac Phillips, like you mentioned, then there's a Del Mastro, Del Mastro and Nolan Allen and Rockford. I mean, there are some, nice pieces. Now, not all of them are going to be on this roster when the Blackhawks are competitive because you just, there are six spots on, on the back end and Seth Jones is signed to a long-term deal. Korchinski is likely going to be here for a, a very long time as well. So it's like, you only got two spots in for the middle pairing. And so are you going to have like a skilled player on the third pair? I don't know. It's just, it's going to be very fascinating to see how this blue line shakes out in three, four years when it, the core starts to round out, but it's a very good problem to have if you're Chicago right now, because if you would have told me a few years ago, why Kaiser is going to be, he's going to be, a, he's going to be a guy like he's, he's going to be, he's going to be good. And if you told me Alex Vlasic is going to be, you know, playing top pairing minutes through the first month of the season and, you know, Kevin Korchinski, obviously we didn't know it at the time, but they ended up getting the seven overall pick and, and he's looked great. I mean, he's, he's, a very young 19. He's going to play this entire year, 19 years old, which is, which is crazy to me because he's, he's still eligible to be a slide candidate. Like he, so it's, it's, and it takes longer for defensemen to develop, obviously. Um, So the fact that he's going to be here full time this year, this season in the NHL is, I mean, a testament to where his game is at. And then like you mentioned, Isaac Phillips, I mean, this guy, I mean, mid to later round pick. I can't remember where exactly he was. Fourth, but I think. Fourth round, right? I was going to say fifth, but fourth round pick. I mean, that, and he was like the, he was a guy that kind of fast track. I mean, he, he was like, he made his NHL it was like two years ago. I mean, as a fourth round pick, that's, that's wildly impressive. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how this all pans out, but I think the Blackhawks have a very good problem. The one thing I will say, Jack, is the the theme that we see with this regime is, defensemen that are big they're heavy um kaiser uh i know kaiser is i guess the smallest of the group at six feet or he might be six foot one but he doesn't play small he's he's a really good skater and he he um you know he doesn't look small out there at all um so you, you know you look at the flasics the phillips korchinski these are all tall guys del mastro down there in rockford Th- these are big guys and so it's that's probably going to be a theme when they get to the NHL or well, I guess full full time NHL players when the Blackhawks are contenders again. That blue line corpse is going to be they're going to be big and they're going to be hard to play against. Sam Brunzel, another big boy who was a first yeah, round yep, pick on exactly. the back end too. And by the way, I don't even know why I questioned you. Isaac Phillips was a fifth round pick, man. Was he? <laughs> little little face palm from your um, no, all good. Here. He was a fifth round pick. Uh, hey, it just more so validates how impressive it was that he's been here. You know, like that's a fifth a fifth round pick is a dart throw in today's NHL. That that's I mean, to hit on a player like that of his caliber, I know he hasn't done anything yet in the NHL, but he has a future. I mean, he he's gonna be a guy. There are plenty of fifth round picks that do not end up doing what Isaac Phillips has already done so far. I, I remember uh he made the jump to the professional scene early because of the OHL COVID shutdown, and that's what like yes. kind of kickstarted him a little bit. So he's kind of had an intriguing ascension and I just wonder how it's going to work for him this year because it does feel like he could still benefit from time in Rockford, but I don't know necessarily he has like that much more to prove down there after being a top pairing guy last year. Do you kind of feel the same way? Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. I, 
but I, I see why the Blackhawks are doing what they're doing because you have Vlasic and Vlasic and Korchinski. They're full time NHLers, right? Yeah. But then you got Murphy Kaiser's, and Jones. Kaiser's kind of the questionable one. It feels like like that was at least my question going into this year. I was feeling like they were going to do the same thing they did with Vlasic. And right. obviously two different situations. So that was one thing that I think just caught me by surprise, maybe a little bit. Yeah. And I think this is where it's going to get a little tricky with the defenseman is if you have Vlasic, let's just say Vlasic is uh, the future second pairing defenseman. Let's just say it's Korchinski and Jones as the, the future top pairing. And then it's Vlasic and let's just say hypothetically Murphy, but maybe somewhere, maybe, maybe down the road, you substitute Murphy for Renzel, right? Where do you put Vlasic? Is he a third pairing guy? Is he is he more of a second pairing guy? I don't know. So that's where you maybe have some duplicates. And in a few years, when the Blackhawks' core is starting to crystallize, they're going to have some tough decisions to make because they might have to use some of these players as trade chips to go out and get big pieces to add and to start filling out the roster to take a next step, not just in the rebuild, but hey, like we want to be playoff contenders now and Stanley Cup contenders. Like let's go out and Let's go out and be big fish hunting. And so that's where they might have to, they have to start weeding out some of the guys that they might have a redundancy of whether it's on the back end or forwards. Um, that's why it's crucial. These next few years is to kind of figure out, okay, are, is this guy going to be a core player or is he going to be a complimentary piece? If he's not a core player, well, then let's get rid of him for someone that is going to be a core player, or let's trade him for a complimentary piece where maybe he's a different kind of complimentary piece. So it's um, it's again good problems to have uh, right. if you're if you're the Blackhawks because they still have a boatload of picks that they haven't used yet, um, so yeah, uh, it's just but the back end specifically it's going to be interesting because they have Seth Jones locked up, Connor Murphy's on the on the the right of the second pairing he, he might not be here long term or like part of the Stanley Cup, uh, contender when they are when they are in four years or whatever it is but. Um, so that's where you might see guys playing on their offside. You know, you got, you might see a Kaiser playing on the right side. We saw Nicholas Jalmerson do that in Chicago where he was, he was put on the right when he was playing with Oduya or he was playing with Duncan Keith. That's how you might actually have to make yourself valuable to the organization. Nolan Allen, someone else who's been getting some reps on his off wing since he made yep. the jump to the professional level as well. Yeah. It's going to be really fascinating to see, uh, which ones of these, you know, this deep prospect pool, that's arguably, I would say it's the deepest in the NHL, <clears throat> excuse me. I know the ducks have a really high end prospect pool, but with the picks and how deep the Blackhawks prospect pool is. Yeah. That is the one problem, if you will, about it is there's just not going to be room ultimately mm -hmm. for everyone at the end of the day. So yeah, going to be really intriguing to see who ends up staying in, who winds up being in that kind of odd man out type of situation. Charlie, last question I have for you, brother. When the Blackhawks were just about to start their season, we had some pretty similar comparisons for Connor Bedard's rookie campaign. I got it up here. You had 34 goals, 50 assists for 84 points. I had 38 goals, 46 assists for 84 points. So we were both just over a point per game for Connor Bedard there. Pretty crazy. We had the same number of points. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you now that we're, we're 13 games in, do you, do you think we, we low balled them? Do you think we are a little too high or do you think we should feel pretty good about where our predictions were? So I think, I think I'm going to stay with my points. I'm still going to stay with the 84 points. If you ask me right now, though, I think I might flip the goals and assists. I might say 50 goals and 34 assists. I'm only half joking by the way, because he's on a heater. I mean, he's got, he, he's got what nine goals and four assists, five yes. assists. So, I mean, he's 13, already got 13, and 13. Yeah. So he's already, he's already got a bunch of goals. Um, that's kind of almost his goals total have, have basically doubled his assists. So I'm not sure if I'm going to be right in that department. I will say this though. The power play has been surprisingly bad. I, I, I gotta be honest, Jack. I, my go out on a limb prediction, I guess one of them was the Blackhawks were going to finish in the top half of the power play this year, just because I saw the way they were utilizing Bedard in training camp and how he was just all over the ice. Yeah. I'm like, this is going to be a good power play. And it stinks. It's, <laughs> it's bottom five of the NHL as we record this. So at some point I'm holding out hope that this will feed into my prediction, but at some point I feel like the power play is going to get hot. And the player that's going to benefit from that is Bedard because he's going to pick, pick up the cookies, whether it's goals assists. Um, but right now he's on track point per game player. We're both looking good with our points. I'm just not confident in my, in my goal to assist ratio right now. 
it's going to be, yeah, if the power play isn't able to pick it up, it does feel like it, it's going to be a little difficult for him to just rack up as many assists because there are going to be some limitations to what this Blackhawks offense can do. But goal scoring from what we've seen the last two games, we, we might be lowballing him a little bit here. I mean, I didn't want yeah. to go too crazy because when you're giving out predictions or projections for a season, right, especially with 18-year-old Connor Bedard, yeah. I didn't want to be like, he's not in 50. I didn't want to be like, yeah. anything less than 50 is a bust. I didn't want to be that guy whatsoever. And I, I thought even 40 would be like, okay, on this Blackhawks team, can he realistically get 40? Looks like he can get 40. Yeah. I didn't want to be that guy before the season that's like, I think what was the over under for most odds makers? It was like 69 and a half. Yeah. I think that's what the mark was. And I'm just like, <laughs> Connor Bedard's probably looking at that number. Like I'm going to eat that number up. Right. <laughs> so I'm like, all right, what's a sweet spot where it's not totally crazy, but it's also like 69 and a half. I feel like, you know, he, he can, that. he can break that. So I felt like 84 was a sweet spot. Well, then I think it was like the day, I think it was like two days before opening night. I published that story. And then it was the next day or the day after that, uh, Frank Saravalli of Daily Faceoff, he was like, his one of his bold predictions was Bedard is going to finish with 100 points. And so I saw him the next day at uh, Morning Skate in Pittsburgh. And I'm like, wow. I was like, you are way bolder than yeah, I am. Right? Like, I thought I was bold. And you were like, you you totally elevated what I thought was bold. So we'll see. I, I mean, he's I guess he still could flirt with closer to 100. But um, j- just because he's starting to figure it out. but. I'll stick with my 84. I just don't know if I feel, I feel like he's going to, he's on track to surpass. What's, what's the pace for goals? I he think he's on a 50 something goal pace. Seven, I think. Yeah. So, Ooh. so I don't know, maybe, maybe it's going to be closer to 40, 44 or 44, 40. I don't know. One way or the other. Those are yeah. great numbers. My friend, those are great numbers. Hey, great minds think alike. We're on the, we're on the same wavelength. Absolutely. Charlie. Thank you again for coming on the show, my man. I always appreciate you. Always have fun talking Blackhawks hockey. And let's make sure not to uh, not to not chat for too long in the in the distant future, my friend. Yes, absolutely. Thank you as always for having me. And I cannot wait to see what other invention that you uh, put onto this show. What else we're gonna have? We're gonna have a scrolling ticker again. We're gonna have a rundown. We're gonna have. I don't know. I don't know what we're going to have, but Jack, I feel like you're, you and your team, they're, they're going to have something that impresses me the next time we're on. I can't take any credit for it. That's, that's not my department of expertise. I am not, not very good at the background type of stuff, but fortunate to be part of a network that is, is really doing well at that. So thank you again, Charlie, as always, um, everyone out there listening, make sure to go and check out Charlie's stuff. Follow him on socials. If you don't, because you are missing out on the best Blackhawks content, his Twitter account or X isn't it an X account. Are we tweeting anymore, dude? I, I don't know. Tra- Corey Perry's on the Blackhawks. I don't know what to make of this. World I still anymore, say but... tweet. I still say tweet and I will continue to say tweet. And by the way, you added that best Blackhawks content. This is going to be a massive Venmo that you're getting from me tonight. <laughs> just so you know, you're going to get, just send me your handle right after this. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I had a little bit of a bad day on the football slate yesterday, so it might come in. It might okay. Come in okay. We'll, we'll regroup. I'll send you this big Venmo and then you'll use that for, for this coming week to, to get that money back. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Once again, everyone, Charlie Romeliotis, Blackhawks insider for NBC sports, Chicago, go and follow him on socials to stay all caught up on the latest Blackhawks news and updates and go and check out the Blackhawks talk podcast as well. A hundred percent free or ever you may be listening to your podcasts.